and professor at Liberty University School of Divinity. And uh, the first 50 people who were uh, in the room today received a, a free copy of his book. And uh, if you did not receive a copy, I apologize. But uh, I do think they have them at Lifeway and on Amazon, and you might be able to uh, borrow it from the library. But uh, it was released late last year. I read the book in January uh, with great interest and um, thought that, that the uh, students and faculty um, would be interested in considering his thesis and being able to ask him questions about it. And this event is sponsored by the uh, Theological and Historical Studies Division, as well as the Baptist Center for Theology and Ministry. And so there's more information about the Baptist Center at the table. Uh, primarily, what I'd be interested in you seeing is the website, baptistcenter.com, because you can receive, uh, you, can, um, you can see online issues of our journal, Journal for Baptist Theology and Ministry, that stretch all the way back to 2003. They have uh, articles as well as book reviews. The spring issue focused on the theme of theology of youth ministry and included book reviews from uh, several of you in this room. Uh, at the risk of leaving some of them out, Casey Hoff had a couple of book reviews in there, PhD students, um, Dustin Turner, Andrea Robinson, uh, and, and others, uh, Andrew Hollingsworth, as well as uh, professors who, who review. Um, and so I don't have any other comments. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thornhill. I'm uh, honored to be here and very much appreciate Dr. Harwood's invitation. Uh, I, you, this, you may find this surprising. I'm not a person with a contentious personality. Uh, I tend to be a little bit conflict avoidant which uh, makes it a little bit strange that this is the topic that I pursued in my, in my dissertation uh, for obvious reasons. I'm sure these are discussions that uh, happen frequently and happen uh, with, with sometimes more heat than light uh, on this campus, just as they happen on our campus. So hopefully we'll, we'll be focused on the light and not the heat today, but I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here and uh, entitled the presentation, Discovering the Jewish Roots of Paul's election theology. Uh, I want to talk a little bit first sort of about the, the process in writing the book, which, which has its own story, and thinking uh, really a, a method that set up how I approach this question, and a method that I think is important beyond this question in terms of how we view not only Paul's theology, but the theology of the New Testament in general. And so we'll spend a little bit of time developing that. The, uh, the book, as some of you received, is entitled The Chosen People, Election Paul and Second Temple Judaism. I uh, am a little bit disappointed that IVP does not put Oxford commas in their titles, uh, because I'm a big fan of the Oxford comma. Uh, nonetheless, you'll have to forgive me for that. <clears throat> so the book, uh, obviously, is what you have in front of you today. The story behind the book is that there was a dissertation first, and the dissertation looks uh, quite a bit differently. If, if you're interested and you, you want to, for those of you that love to read dissertations, the three of you in the room, um, you'll, if you're interested, it's on the digital comments page at Liberty. You can find it there and, and read it digitally. Uh, but the dissertation actually started as a paper in a PhD seminar. And the paper in a PhD seminar uh, started with an idea. And the idea started as a set of questions. And a set of questions that converged uh, into the, the proposal that I ended up developing. And one of the reasons I wanted to share that with you today, especially those of you that are students, and even th those of you, whether you're doing undergraduate or graduate or, or doctoral work, um, I think it's sometimes, I, I speak from my experience, so I won't put this on you, but it's easy to approach a research assignment, especially one that you have to do, which are most of the ones that you do when you're a student, uh, for the sake of getting a grade and not necessarily for the sake of answering a question. And uh, the, whole, the whole process of this came out of just trying to ask the right kinds of questions as, as um, I was approaching Paul. So some of, the, some of the backdrop in terms of my thinking, one of the things that sort of developed over time for me was recognizing that Christian interpretation has a history. Uh, most of you in this room already know that because you're, you're studying these things, but 
we, we often come to a theological belief and that belief becomes affirmed. And as we read scripture, we see that belief affirmed in scripture. And we don't always start with scripture to create our, create our beliefs. So uh, our beliefs develop in lots of different ways. It might be from our, uh, our upbringing, our tradition, a particular pastor that we sat under. So we have this web of theological beliefs. And the danger is for all of us that we're simply putting those on the text of Scripture as we're interpreting Scripture. And, and the question is, how do we not do that? How do, we, how do we not simply read it and affirm things that we already believe? How do we read it in order to seek what it's, what it's actually telling us, what it's saying? So ideas have a history. And as it relates to election, obviously, there's, there's a long history. Uh, a little bit of a daunting task to do a dissertation on election because one of the things a dissertation is supposed to do is to say something new in the field that hasn't been said. And so what has not been said about election uh, that I could possibly say? So there are lots of elements of what I'll suggest today that others have said, uh, not put together and not with the backdrop certainly that, that I'm saying it. But also context influences theology. And this is true for us. We have a context, we have a particular uh, place in which we live and ideas that we swim in, and this is true in church history. So Augustine's theology of election, and Dr. Harwood and I were talking this morning, which I, I tend to view as shifting uh, the discussion quite a bit in church history, but that occurred in a particular context, and Augustine's beliefs changed over time. Early Augustine writes things differently than later Augustine, and it seems to me it's the Pelagian controversy that sort of is part of the catalyst at least, for this development in Augustine's thought. The same thing with Luther. Luther had a context. Obviously, he's reacting against certain things within Roman Catholicism that he finds are uh, not lining up with what he's reading in Scripture. But his conversation partner influences how he is interpreting and what questions he is bringing to the, to the text. So, again, how do we get around that? How do we ask the right sorts of questions? I think... Uh, one way that we do that is by focusing on the context of the New Testament. And I, I sometimes like to speak about contexts, plural, rather than context, because I think there, there's a layering here. Um, there are historical aspects to this. There are social. There are culture. There are literary. There's, there's a large dynamic of factors that are involved in the world around the New Testament. There are different political structures, different theological beliefs, different worldviews. And the writings of the New Testament flow out of those things. And that's not to say that they're determined by them. Uh, that's not to say that they're not saying anything unique, because certainly they are. Um, but, but they are also interacting with the world around them. So we begin by recognizing, I think in part, um, that we have to understand first century culture. We have to understand first century thought. And that should be our starting point for how we approach the New Testament. Uh, this isn't to say we wipe away the discipline of historical theology. I think there's tremendous value in that. That we wipe away the discipline of systematic theology. I think there's tre tremendous value in that. Um, but ultimately, if we're not wrestling with the world of the New Testament and its message in its original context, I think we're sort of doomed to simply repeat a certain cycle in how we develop our beliefs. And so this in part means we have to think about what questions the authors in the New Testament were actually asking versus the questions that we want them to answer. And those two things don't always line up. Sometimes they do, and when they do, it makes things easy for us. Uh, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes there are gaps. There are questions that they're answering that aren't identical to the ones we want answered. And it's a little bit more complex to, to get to our, our questions. But I think we need to start with theirs. So one of the, again, not a person uh, interested in controversy, but if you're familiar with the new perspective, you're probably familiar with the controversy around it. Um, the new perspective has been helpful to me, and I'll define in a second what, that, uh, what exactly I take that to mean. Uh, but the new per perspective on Paul, if you're not familiar with it, E.P. Sanders is often noted as sort of the generating force behind the new perspective, in particular a book he wrote around 1977 called Paul and Palestinian Judaism. And the question that Sanders primarily was asking is what was Second Temple Judaism? Uh, what did Jews during the Second Temple period think, believe, do? Um, were, and, and 
Sanders was after what he referred to a, as a pattern of religion. So he's basically looking for um, what are the common threads that stitch together the various groups, the various belief systems that were present in Second Temple Judaism. So as I define the new perspective, the new perspective is a, is a revised view of Judaism that then has implications for how we under, understand the New Testament. When you get into specifics about what new perspective authors actually believe, you'll find that they actually disagree on quite a lot and, and quite a lot of things that are pretty fundamental in our theology of, of Paul. They focus primarily on Paul. It's referred to as the new perspective on Paul, but certainly has implications for, I think, the, the entire New Testament. So what was Sanders' thesis? Sanders' thesis was uh, Second Temple Judaism had become... Uh, Basically, a caricature had developed of Second Temple Judaism within New Testament scholarship, where Second Temple Judaism, or Judaism in general, was understood to be a works-based religion. Uh, so the way that people were saved, the caricature goes, was by doing the right kinds of things, and that doing is what saved them. What Sanders challenged is, was that actually what Jews in the Second Temple period themselves believed? Now, there, there are aspects of Sanders' method that, that I'm... Um, I'm critical of. There are some of his conclusions that I'm, that I'm critical of. But on the whole, I think Sanders was right in saying Second Temple Jews didn't have a works-based view of salvation. The works that factored in, and these are primarily what we might refer to as works of the law, which, which is one of Paul's phrase, uh, these, are, these are covenantal works. These are works that occur in the context of the covenant, which uh, primarily are... Uh, connected to the Mosaic law, and, and there were different interpretations. Uh, so not every Jew agreed necessarily on what it meant to obey the law, uh, but, but that's largely Sanders' thesis. And so this begs the question then, particularly when it comes to books like Romans and Galatians, where Paul is interacting with either Jewish or Jewish Christian beliefs, and if Paul isn't debating a works-centered view of salvation, this raises the obvious question of, of what is he debating? Um, so that revised view of, of Judaism, I take Sanders again, even though I, I critique him in various ways, uh, in general to be correct, and I think that factors into how we interpret what exactly is going on in the New Testament. Uh, so those factors sort of came together in terms of how I approach this thesis, recognizing the importance of the context of the New Testament, and particularly the Jewish context of the New Testament, what did Jews actually believe? As it relates to election, I was surprised that there actually hadn't been a ton of work done on this. There were a lot of some assumptions about what election meant in Judaism, and some of them I think were correct, uh, and others weren't. But there were really only a handful of, of conversation partners, in spite of the fact that there, there's been this pretty large revolution in Second Temple studies, especially since the, the discovery of Qumran. There's, just, there's such a huge body of literature out there. So, um, so that's the, sort of the backstory behind my approach. One of the things that I think is important as well is that the doctrine of election, as we sometimes refer to it, and Paul obviously doesn't call it a doctrine, that's, that's our, our word, um, it has a story. And we often think backwards about this story. So we think from our context back through the reformers, back to Augustine, and those are our conversation partners as we think about election. The story that I have in mind is one that precedes Paul. There's a story of election in the Old Testament that travels also through Second Temple Judaism and that I think has to inform how we are reading what Paul is saying in his letters. So not only is there a Jewish context we have to wrestle with, but there's an Old Testament context we have to wrestle with. And, and those two things obviously aren't mutually exclusive. The Jews of the Second T Temple period are reading the Old Testament. Um, sometimes they're reading it in ways that are very straightforward, maybe, and sometimes they're reading it in ways that are much less straightforward. Um, so there's a challenge in teasing out some of the distinctions here. So what is the story of election in the Old Testament? Uh, basically, the story of election in the Old Testament is God chose Israel. There are a couple of key passages that illustrate this for us. Exodus 19, 5 to 6. Uh, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep the covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, uh, 
and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Notice the phrases that I've bolded here. It's the nation. It's the people. It's a group that God has chosen. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 14, 2, these aren't identical. If you look them up, they're slightly differently, but they're, they're close enough that I've just uh, provided 7, 6 here. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Okay, so largely the story in the Old Testament is God chose Israel, and the emphasis on how this story is told is on the collective of that people, the people as a whole. God has chosen to form a people through Abraham. He has covenantly tied himself to Israel. We also see, and this is a more minor note in the, in the uh in the Old Testament, we also see that God has chosen servants, and some of the same language of choosing applies to them. So we think of the examples of Abraham, of Noah, of Moses, of David, of the servant, uh, the suffering servant of Isaiah, of Cyrus. And Cyrus maybe looks like a little bit of an oddball here, um, because right, everyone else that God has chosen, are these are a part of his covenant people. Cyrus is a pagan king, but God chose Cyrus, I think, with the same, at least, framework as we understand it of, of why he chose or how he chose Moses and David and others. He chose them to fulfill a specific role, to have a specific purpose. And so as you read these, uh, what I refer to as, as um, individu individual election passages in the Old Testament, the emphasis is always on the activity, the role, the work of that individual, there is never any, in the context, clear soteriological connection that's made to God's choosing of these people. So most of them were what, what we might refer to as saved people. These were a part of God's covenant people. But there are obviously exceptions to that as well, and Cyrus being one of the main ones. <clears throat> so as we come to the second temple context, uh, in, in my research, it does not seem to me that the Second Temple literature departs from this framework that we find in the Old Testament. Election is about God's choice of Israel. It's focus, focused on the collective of God's people. When individuals are described with this kind of choosing language, it typically has in mind uh, their, their either service or their character, as we'll see from some examples. And this is the big question for me. Uh, if this is not what we find in the Old Testament, if this is not what we find in Second Temple Judaism, and looking prior to Augustine, if this is largely not what we find even in the early church fathers, then is this what we find in the New Testament writers, and is this what we find in Paul? Now, those factors don't necessarily eliminate the possibility that this is what we find in the New Testament and in Paul, but I think it at least raises a, a very serious question as to whether or not that should be our primary approach or whether we should seek to interpret Paul and the New Testament writers within that context. And if we can, then we view them as largely being in continuity with what's going on in the Jewish and Old Testament world. So one of the major things that I do in the book, one of the things that I'm excited about today is, is kind of unpacking what Second Temple Judaism was. We primarily uh, get a window into this from several groups of writings. Um, we have the Apocrypha, which in, in Baptist circles and in many Protestant circles in general is sort of a dirty word, right? So like you sub your toe and it's Apocrypha. Um, we have, we have the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writings from Qumran, and there are lots of writings that we find at Qumran. Um, I'm specifically looking at what are referred to as the sectarian writings at Qumran, so the, the literature that the Qumran community produced, not just copied. So we have, you know, Old Testament documents. We have the Book of Jubilees is found at Qumran, but uh, it's not thought that the Qumran community was actually responsible for writing it. And then the Pseudepigrapha. And the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha is basically a collection. It's, it's titled Pseudepigrapha, which isn't a great name. Um, because many of the works in the Pseudepigrapha are falsely attributed to certain Old Testament characters. So we have several books of Enoch, for example, which we are 
fairly certain Enoch himself did not actually write. We have uh, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, which we're fairly certain the Twelve Patriarchs did not write. So um, it's referred to that, but not all of the literature is necessarily falsely attributive. We have, we have some that don't fit into that category. So in looking at those three groups of literature, and we're going to look at some examples today, um, I sort of organized this in a couple of, under a couple of main headings or themes, and we're going to uh, work through these today. Those are individual election. Uh, so when we find language of choosing or selection spoken of with specific individuals, what does that entail in the context of these documents? Corporate election, where the, where the emphasis again is on the collective, the whole people of God. Uh, the identification of the elect is actually a very big question. And this is one of the things I think that, that largely has been overlooked. Um, a, a book that was very helpful to me in uh, this project was uh, entitled The Survivors of Israel by Mark Adam Elliott. And Elliot, um, in, in quite painstaking detail, um, is addressing this question of who were the elect, which I take to be one of the central questions that Second Temple Jews were asking about election. Not what was election, or not does how God choose people, but who are God's people and how do we identify them? There was, there was actually quite the debate about um, who we should consider God's people to be. Then the question of election in the Gentiles, which is a, a fairly minor note that's played in the Second Temple literature, but one that we, we do see come up from time to time, and the question of divine and human agency. So with those sort of background categories in mind, uh, in the book I tie these to several passages in Paul. I thought today what might be most valuable is to look specifically at Romans 9 to 11, since when people think about election in Paul, that's what we think about, right? It's Romans 9 to 11. So uh, once we've developed some of this, this background information, we will take a journey into Paul. <clears throat> so individual election, I think that there are three major ways that this is portrayed in the Second Temple literature. One, sometimes elect, is simply a character description. When you look at the lexical information, the words that uh, are, are often connected to the concept of election, uh, the range of meaning can actually just mean an excellent person, a choice person. And so sometimes I think it's the character of these individuals that is involved. In Ben Sira, this book goes by several different names. Uh, the Wisdom of Ben Sira, Ben Sira, Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, depending on, on what translation you're reading. We have Moses uh, being discussed in chapter 45. From Jacob's stock, he produced a generous man who found favor in the eyes of all humanity. Beloved by God and people, Moses of, Moses of blessed memory, he gave him commandments for his people and showed him something of his glory. For his loyalty and gentleness, he sanctified him, choosing him alone out of all human beings. Now notice the progression here. For his loyalty, he sanctified him. If we understand election to exclusively be a soteriological idea, what we would, what we would interpret Ben Sira to be saying here is God chose to save Moses because Moses was loyal and gentle. I, I think in the context, what Ben Sira is focused on is not Moses' soteriological standing, but Moses' role as the deliverer of God's people. So God chose Moses to fulfill that role because Moses was loyal and gentle. Similarly of Aaron in Sirach 45, he raised up Aaron, a holy man like Moses, his brother of the tribe of Levi. He chose him out of all the living to offer sacrifices. There are other examples in this particular passage in Ben Sirah, but again, notice the mention of his character precedes God's choosing of Aaron, and God's choosing of Aaron here is specifically for him to offer sacrifices. So he has a priestly role that he intends for Aaron to fulfill, and because Aaron meets the qualifications, he has the right kind of character to fulfill that role, God chooses him for it. Uh, we also have in the additional Psalms of David, in Psalm 153, which, right, our Psalter ends at 150, so these are, these are add-ons, uh, these are non-canonical add-ons. He has rescued the soul of his elect from the hands of death and delivered his Holy One from destruction. Some commentators note these two terms here are paralleled, 
And Psalms obviously are poetic, and the paralleling of them seems to indicate that there is a, an emphasis with both of these terms on the character of the one who has been delivered. In First Enoch, we have, uh, in, in first, I'm, I'm going to be referring to First Enoch broadly, but First Enoch is actually five different pieces of literature that are, that are put together as one book. Um, so in First Enoch, in several different places, we find the combination of several titles uh, to describe the people of God. They are elect, they are holy, and they are righteous. And again, Second Temple uh, Jewish scholars uh, frequently note that, that these terms combined together are emphasizing the character, the quality of God's people. So Van Lanningham says the term emphasizes the community's faithful obedience to God. Again, this is not, um, this is not a soteriological framework that's being used when this language is implemented in First Enoch. So sometimes election is connected to character. It's the kind of people God's people ought to be. And this is obviously, as we looked at examples, closely connected to their being chosen for service, for, for particular roles. So again, we mention uh, ben Sira has Moses and Aaron and David in mind. In Psalm 151, which uh, we have at Qumran, uh, a reference, a description of God's choosing of David over his brothers. And notice, notice the language here. Though their stature was tall, their hair handsome, the Lord God did not choose them, but he sent and took me from behind the flock. He made me a leader to his people. So though they had the outward appearance of what a king should be, they didn't have the inward quality, and God thus chose David instead of choosing his brothers. That maybe has some implications for our political uh, discussions that are, that are going on right now as well. You, O Lord, Psalm of Solomon 17.4, choose David. Choose David for what? To be saved? No, you choose David to be king over Israel. Okay, so uh, election as a character description, election as chosen for service. And then sometimes we have this category of corporate representation. Now, unfortunately, there's not a, a text um, that I think clearly illustrates this, so I've tried to, to choose a couple. Um, but when you read a book like Jubilees or First Enoch or, or the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, there are times when individuals represent something beyond themselves. They represent a larger group of, of persons. Um, very similar to what we see in the Old Testament. Israel, right, we think of Israel primarily as the nation, but where did Israel get its name? It's got its na it got its name from Jacob being renamed as Israel. So Jacob, in some sense, is representative of Israel. And there are actually some passages in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophets, where, where it's not really clear, are they talking about Israel the person, or are they talking about Israel the nation? Are they talking about Jacob the person, or are they talking... So there's, there's some, um, you know, substitution between the individual and the group that takes place. So Jubilees uh, is, is one of the books that I think illustrates this, this very well, and I'll just read the, uh, the bolded portions here. In this section in Jubilees, it's discussing uh, God not choosing Ishmael and Esau, but choosing Jacob. He did not choose them, though they are the children of Abraham, because he knew them. But he chose Israel, the person and the man, to be his people. Jacob as representative of the people of, of Israel. In Jubilees 22, may, may the God of all bless you. This is Abraham giving a blessing to Jacob. And may he elect you and your seed so that you may become a people for him. May he sanctify some of your sons. So notice the connection between the individual Jacob and the larger group he, rep he represents, which is indicated also by the seed metaphor. Sounds, right? We see some similarities here to some of the, way that, the ways that Paul talks about Abraham, for example, or about Jesus. And may he sanctify some of your sons. To me, this indicates the author of Jubilees is saying, uh, yes, Israel is your chosen people, but not every ethnic Jew is going to remain a part of that chosen people. So there is uh, an implication here. And this is something that Jubilees actually develops quite extensively when you just read through the narrative of the book. Um, so Jacob represents basically faithful Jews. Esau represents either. Sometimes it seems like maybe Esau represents Gentiles. Uh, but possibly in some context, Esau represents unfaithful Jews. 
and they stand as a representative of a bigger group. Uh, I mentioned the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. There are these Levi and Judah passages in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, and we won't look at examples of them, but Mark Adam Elliott, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he takes these to actually be an indication of this, this idea of corporate representation. The author of the Testaments took Levi and Judah to be a designation for the righteous in Israel, which he replaced with the more nationalistic term, Jacob and Israel, as found in Genesis. So the, the author of the Testaments, Eliot suggests, has basically renamed Israel as a way of recognizing that not all ethnic Jews have remained faithful to the covenant obligations. Not all ethnic Jews are actually a part of God's people. Then in First Enoch, we have this really, really interesting figure of the righteous or the elect one that occurs in First Enoch. Sometimes he just, he's described with son of man language, which is re re very reminiscent, obviously, of Daniel 7, um, some, some similar imagery there. And he actually at one point is seated on a throne. Um, so all sorts of debate among Jewish scholars as to what exactly is that, is that supposed to be indicating about who this uh, righteous or elect one is. But Nicholsburg, in noting this theme which occurs throughout First Enoch, says, the term the chosen emphasizes the status of the author's people as clients of the chosen one. The chosen one is related to the chosen as the righteous one, another title used for the same figure, is related to the righteous. So notice again these character descriptions, but also the, the, the idea of corporate representation that is presented here in First Enoch. Very interesting also, uh, Azazel, who is a fallen angel, has his chosen ones, his elect ones. And so he is representative of the character of these basically wicked people or wicked angels. It's not clear exactly which one they are, um, but, but he has his contingent, which he represents as well. So clearly not soteriologically loaded if the fallen angels have their elect ones as well. Uh, so that, I think, is in a nutshell what we see in as far as the individual men dimension of election in Second Temple Judaism. There's much more that's said about the collective, and we're going to look at a couple of different ways that that's portrayed. Uh, one is through what I refer to as corporate metaphors. And again, I think you'll, you'll note some pretty um, obvious similarities with, with Paul in particular and with, even with the Gospel of John and with other texts in the New Testament. So at Qumran, the uh, Qumran community, the sectarian community, is frequently referred to as the community, as Israel, as a plantation, as a house, as a, as a foundation, as a congregation, and as sons of light. In First Enoch, the, the uh, people are referred to as the plant of righteousness, a seed, the plant of eternal seed, and as sheep. So there are these images, and, and most of these are of a singular thing. Some of them are not, but most of them are of a, a singular thing that is representing the entirety of the people. That's why I refer to it as a corporate metaphor. So a house is a singular thing, but it's representative of the entirety of the people, a foundation. Um, a plant, a seed, it's a singular thing representative of the entire people. And the way that this is used in the Second Temple literature is often to distinguish between who really is Israel and who is not. And there are different definitions about what constitutes a true person of God uh, in this literature, and we're going to look at some of those competing markers uh, in a bit as well. Sometimes they're simply a corporate focus, so not necessarily with metaphorical language, but where the emphasis is upon God's people as a whole, as a collective. So again in Ben Sira, Israel is the Lord's own portion, language very reminiscent of, of things we hear in the Old Testament. Uh, the Lord will never blot out the descendants of his chosen one or destroy the family line of him who loved him. So he gave a remnant to Jacob and to David a root of his own family. Again, an emphasis, and you see some metaphors even that are mixed in here, but an emphasis upon the collective of God's people while also recognizing not every ethnic Jew, a remnant, belongs to that people. In the Psalms of Solomon, Israel is God's holy inheritance, again reminiscent of the Old Testament, and God grants mercy to Israel. 
And, and just as for Ben Sirah in the Psalms of Solomon, Israel is restricted. It's a true Israel that the psalmist has in mind, uh, not Israel in general. There are certain Jews which clearly he, think, uh, he thinks are outside of the people of God and are, and are going to stand under the judgment of God. At Qumran, we've already mentioned, God has chosen a people in the period of your favor because you have remembered your covenant. You established them. You have renewed your covenant with them. Again, reminiscent of what we just read earlier in Exodus and in, and in Deuteronomy. God has chosen for himself a people, and he has established a covenant with them. In Pseudophilo 9.3, God will not abide his anger, nor will he forget his people forever, nor will he cast forth the race of Israel in vain upon the earth, earth, nor did he establish a covenant with our fathers in vain. One of the tensions in Pseudophilo is it seems like there's no faithful Israelites left. It seems like the nation as a whole is completely apostate. And yet, in spite of that, God is going to maintain his promises to his covenant people to preserve that relationship, even if all of them within a specific generation are rejecting him. So very interesting tension that we see through there. And this is, this is where I think things get pretty interesting. Um, who are the elect? How are they defined? There's, there's a debate, I think, that's occurring within the, the literature. And that's not to say that every document agrees, disagrees with every other document. Um, but there are points of tension between them where clearly the way the people of God are defined over here is not the same way the people of God are defined over here. Sometimes these conditions are implicit. Okay, so I won't, I won't read through these passages, but uh, basically it indicates that uh, certain Jews who are pious, who are faithful, who maintain their hope in God, who repent, those are the ones who God will respond to. Those are the, the ones God will, as they turn to him, he will return to them, as the prophetic language often says. So there are implicit conditions, and what, what I mean by that is clearly there are some Jews who stand on the outside of God's people who are going to face judgment, even though it's not specifically stated the reason, okay, there's not a specific sin or offense or something as to why they stand outside of God's people. Uh, we'll skip through these for the sake of time. Then we have explicit conditions. And in some of these writings, it's very, very clear uh, what markers actually define who God's people are. And if you don't have those markers, if you don't meet those qualifications, clearly you are on the outside. In the book of Jubilees, uh, proper observance of the Sabbath, having basically nothing to do with Gentiles, uh, avoidance of idolatry, and those two things are connected for the book of Jubilees. So if you mess with Gentiles, you're probably going to fall into idolatry. Therefore, don't have anything to do with Gentiles. And proper circumcision. There are certain sins that are mentioned in the book of Jubilees. If you commit these, you have no hope for restoration. Okay? You are, if you're not properly circumcised, there's no hope that, that you'll be able to actually be in God's people. Very explicit. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, things like sexual immorality, uh, infidelity, intermarriage with the Gentiles, profaning the temple, witchcraft, idolatry, and notice rebelling against Levi and Judah. If they stand as representatives of the community, rebelling against the community means you're put on the outside. In 1 Maccabees, Sabbath, dietary regulations, proper circumcision, uh, support of the Hasmoneans. This, this one is really interesting to me. In, in 1 Maccabees 13, uh, 26, we are told all Israel mourns Jonathan's death. But we know from 1 Maccabees that not all of the Jews were actually crazy about what the Maccabees were doing. So the implication is, if you aren't mourning Jonathan's death, you aren't actually a part of Israel. If you're not supporting, and it's, it's thought that 1 Maccabees is written after the revolt when the Hasmonean leadership has been established. So a further implication would be, if you aren't supporting the Hasmonean leadership, you aren't really a part of Israel. And then participating in the temple, okay? If you aren't participating properly in the temple, you are not in God's people. Some similarities, the first and second Maccabees are different, different books, different audiences, but some similarities with Sabbath, dietary regulations, and proper circumcision are, up, are upheld as things that mark out God's people. 
The Psalms of Solomon, repentance, purity, piety. Qumran, sexual immorality. If you have wealth, the Qumran community was a very aesthetic community. Uh, they lived basically completely within their means. They intended to accumulate no wealth. And they looked with great suspicion on those who did. There was often a connection. Uh, we find this in the Old Testament as well, but in Second Temple literature, that those who accumulate wealth are basically oppressors. Uh, and if you don't want to be an oppressor, don't accumulate wealth. But for Qumran, participating in the temple means you are cut off from the people of God. They thought the temple, because of its leadership, was defiled and corrupt. So in 1 Maccabees, you got to participate in the temple. At Qumran, you got to avoid the temple. We have these competing markers of identity that are at play here. Keeping the feasts, helping the poor, and then keeping the regulations of the community. So they had a very narrow definition of who God's people were. If you are a part of the Qumran community, you are a part of God's people. If you're not, tough luck. First Enoch, proper calendar observance. Now this is kind of odd for us, but uh, there was a debate. Should we follow a lunar calendar or a solar calendar or a mixed calendar? And different groups within Judaism held to different preferences. And so for First Enoch, if you aren't following the right calendar, um, this means you aren't observing the Sabbath correctly, you aren't observing the feasts correctly, therefore you're not observing the law correctly. And the implication is you're not a part of God's people. Okay? So competing markers of identity, a focus on the collective in general. We also have the, the issue of election and the Gentiles. Now by and large, the Jewish documents of the Second Temple period don't speak very highly of the Gentiles. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, so in 2 Maccabees, in the Sibylline Oracles, and in the Wisdom of Solomon, there, uh, and we also have the, the Jewish inclusion-exclusion question. So here, it seems like most Jews are in, in these documents. It seems like they have a pretty broad understanding of how many Jews are a part of God's people, though it's still presented as a conditional idea. But we have counter to that, the Psalms of Solomon, Qumran, the Testament of Moses, Pseudophilo, and Jubileves have a very narrow understanding of who is actually in God's people. It seems like a very few Jews, isolated usually specifically to the community that's in view, are actually a part of God's people. Similar thing with the Gentiles. We have usually eschatological inclusion of the Gentiles in God's people. For the most part, they weren't viewing this as something that would happen in the here and now. It's something that's going to happen in the eschaton. When God comes and sets everything right, the Gentiles, like Isaiah said, are going to start coming to Zion. They're going to start worshiping Yahweh. So in Tobit, in the Sibylline Oracles, and in First Enoch, we have indications that they seem to view that there was going to be fairly broad Gentile inclusion. Yet in the Testament of Moses, there is no Gentile inclusion. The Testament of Moses says basically Gentiles are damned from before they are created. They have no hope. They're going to be judged. Uh, similar again in Jubilees and at Qumran. Then we have the question of divine and human agency. Who moves first, right? Uh, is, does God initiate? Does God carry through the whole process? What's the, what's the role of human responsibility? Uh, is, is it an either or? Is it a both and? And we find some different emphases here in the Second Temple literature. So, Jubilees 5.13, the judgment of all of them, referring here at least to the evil angels, but possibly also to wicked humans, has been ordained and written in the heavenly tablets. It seems like this is a predetermined thing. This, this is going to be so because it's been recorded already. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, God smooths the path of the one whom you choose, and you pre prevent him from sinning against you. Yet, in the so it seems like God's in charge of the whole thing. But in the same breath, the psalmist at Qumran here prays, prevent your servant from sinning against you. So he says, God's going to prevent me from sinning against him, but I'm going to ask God to prevent me from sinning against him. So a very, very interesting tension there. Also in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Damascus document, for God did not choose them at the beginning of the world, and before they were established, he knew their deeds. 
Uh, the wisdom of Solomon, you overlook people's sins so that they may, may repent. You detest none of the things that you have made. And yet, just eight verses later, you were aware their origin was evil and their wickedness inborn. Their way of thinking would never change. They were an accursed race from the beginning, speaking of the Gentiles here. So is it that nothing God made is detestable to him? He loves it all. Or were the Gentiles made completely as wicked people with no hope of, of being saved? Very interesting tension. And in First Enoch, the heavenly tablets are said to contain all the deeds of humanity and all the children of the flesh for all the generations of the world. So it seems like basically everything that's ever happened or going to happen has already been written down. Uh, so it's easy to see why a lot of scholars take this to be an indication of divine determinism. All of this has already been predetermined. Uh, therefore, it's going to ha happen exactly as God has arranged it. The thing that's really interesting to me, in some of these very same texts, we have what seems to be the opposite perspective going on as it relates to human responsibility. We have Ben Sira. There are some passages in Ben Sira that are in tension, but notice what he says here. Um, if you choose, you can keep the commandments. Before everyone are life and death, whichever they choose will be given to them. It seems like the ball's in your court, right? It's up to you as to how you're going to respond. In the Psalms of Solomon, we have this mention that turning back to God is going to happen prior to uh, God cleansing Israel. So it seems like the initiative is that humans respond and then God comes in and intervenes. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay, so the passages that we just read about, it seems like everything's basically uh, already predetermined and God's in charge of it all. He's going to not only save us, but prevent us from sinning. And yet in, uh, in 1 QS, we have this statement, he shall admit into the covenant of grace all those who have freely devoted themselves to the observance of God's precept. So what I think we find here is there's, there's a tension that existed in Second Temple Judaism as it related to the question of divine, initi uh, divine initiative and human agency. There's a tension that they were, it seems, quite comfortable with, uh, that we are very uncomfortable with. We want to resolve that tension. And so we have this, it has to be free will, it has to be divine sovereignty kind of conversation, where it seems like for a lot of authors in the Second Temple period, it was actually, there's some combination of both that are at play. Okay, so to summarize, and then we'll get to Paul, which is probably why all of you uh, wanted, to, wanted to come out today anyway. Election in Second Temple Judaism may emphasize the character or the role of the individual or the group over their soteriological standing. Individual ep uh, election emphasizes character, role, or corporate representation, not individual soteriology. There are varying conditions or markers of, of who exactly God's people are, and some of these are competing with one another. I won't read through all of these, but we've, we've looked at those already. Uh, election is primarily corporate and covenantal, so there's a sense in which it's conditional, and there's a sense in which it's unconditional. We read, we read this tension in numerous Jewish texts. God will not abandon his covenant with Israel, but that does not mean individual Israelites do not have a responsibility to respond appropriately to the covenantal stipulations. Gentiles are often completely excluded, but sometimes they are included, and typically this is eschatologically. God's sovereignty and human responsibility are not mutually exclusive. There is a tension that's present in a number, if not the majority, of these texts. And there is a real, re a real possibility both for repentance. The wicked can repent in most of these texts, ex excluding the Testament of Moses and some of the um, more, more extreme, maybe, examples. And there is a possibility that Israelites can apostatize. Thus, all the warnings against idolatry, against intermarriage with Gentiles, against, uh, against associating with Gentiles at all. So my suggestion is these things combined should inform how we are reading Paul. These serve as the backdrop, basically. This shows us, I think, the conversation that was going on within different Second Temple groups. 
And I think Paul is largely participating in that conversation. I don't think he's creating a new conversation. Uh, I don't think that he's uh, completely departing from what's going on in Second Temple literature. But he is obviously changing the direction, and in some ways pretty dramatically, particularly as it relates to, uh, to Jesus. So, some observations, and obviously we can't... Uh, we can't, and, and I haven't, um, just in full in minutes, exhausted Romans 8 to 11. Um, so we don't have the time for that, nor have I, nor would I claim to, uh, to have it all figured out. So I just want to make some observations through a, a couple of verses here as we uh, look at this, this pretty contentious passage. In 829, and, and these are all things I'm sure most of you are familiar with, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, okay, So that raises for us the election question, right? What I love about this verse and what too often gets missed in our discussion is the end of it. Why did he predestine the people of God? He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. This goes back, I think, to this ethical idea that is to be connected with election. God's people are to be a certain kind of people. They're to look a certain way. And what Paul tells us is God's plan all along was for his people to look like Jesus, to act like Jesus. And this was his eternal plan. This is what I think Paul is saying here. I don't think he's saying God uh, chose certain people and therefore those people are going to be saved. I think he's saying God's plan always was for his people to look like Jesus. One of the indications I think that this is where Paul is going is the larger context of Romans 8. Uh, so we have at the beginning here the gift of the Spirit. One, one verse that's fascinating to me at the beginning of Romans 8, there is now no condemnation, we all know this, right? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is there no condemnation? For the law, okay, I'm going to ignore the genitives here, for the law has set you free. What? The law has set you free. The law of the Spirit of life. Looking back at Romans 7, I think what Paul has set up is a contrast in the spheres of influence idea comes from Klein Snodgrass, uh, an article about 1988, which has been incredibly helpful to me. I I suggest you all read it if you you can go find it. Um, The law wasn't the problem. The problem is what domain is the law in? When the law is in the domain of sin and death, it is powerless to do what God intended it to. When the law is in the domain of the spirit, it can provide life to God's people. The Spirit provides life, but the law is not out of the picture. And, and Snodgrass, I think, does, does a really good job with that. But where Paul goes from there is the restoration of all creation. So this is, in some ways, is I think this is a salvation historical story that Paul is telling. God has intervened. God has put the law in the proper realm so that it can function as he intended it. Uh, the Spirit now empowers you to live as you've always been intended. And the way you've always intended to live, uh, been intended to live, is to image the Son of God. And creation itself is being restored as a, proce- as a part of the process of what God is doing. Okay? Romans 9, 6 to 13. Paul says, Not all those from Israel are Israel. Now, there are some New Testament commentators who come to this verse and say, Paul's making a striking departure from his second temple context because everyone knew if you were an Israelite, you were in Israel. Um, I I think what the literature actually shows is he's basically saying what what everyone else was saying. We know not everyone in Israel is part of Israel. There are certain Jews who are excluded. The question is who's in and who's out and why? What marks who's in? What marks who's out? How is God's people defined? So when Paul brings up Isaac, he says it's Isaac, not Ishmael. I think what Paul is saying here is it's not simply ethnic descent that defines who is in the people of God. Okay, and a lot of commentators agree with it, not that controversial. When he brings up Jacob and Esau, Paul says it's not by works. And this is where I I make a slight departure, so um, you can judge whether I'm right or, or wrong or not. Throughout most of Romans, when Paul talks about works, he's talking about the works of the law. He qualifies that word. He doesn't qualify that here. Okay, this is one of, I think, two places in in the entire letter where he doesn't qualify that. Uh, 
I think because there are lots of connections between Romans 9 to 11 and Romans 3 and 4, I think Paul is assuming that his reader is going to read that into what he's saying here. And so what are the works of the law? The works of the law primarily are those things which distinguish Jews and Gentiles. So in Romans 4, Paul talks uh, almost exclusively about circumcision, whether or not Gentiles need to be circumcised. As we go to the Second Temple background, the debate between Jacob and Esau, Esau is not included, for example, in the book of Jubilees because he's not properly circumcised. Uh, Esau is not included because he ends up marrying Gentile wives. And so there are these uh, basically failings of Esau to fulfill the covenant obligations, and Jacob fulfills them all perfectly. So when Paul says it's not by works, I don't think what he's saying here is people can't earn their salvation. I, now, I wouldn't say Paul thinks people can earn their salvation, uh, but I think what he's saying here is the law is not the determining factor in what marks the people of God. It's not ethnic descent, and it's not whether they are circumcised and do these other things that they're supposed to. The question is then, what is it? It takes Paul a little while to get there. By the end of Romans 9, he answers that question, and we'll look at that soon. So following right after that, he says, then is there injustice with God? It's often translated. The word there is adikia. Uh, if you are familiar with New Testament studies at, at all, you know dikaios language in Paul is probably the most debated terminology in Paul. This is the justification kind of vocabulary. Uh, there is literally more literature out there than any one person could probably ever read in their lifetime. Um, so it's, it's a little bit difficult to get your head around it. What I think Paul is saying here, and this, this is influenced by Wright. Wright, N.T. Wright takes uh, the Dekai language to be primarily about covenant, covenantal faithfulness. So again, you may disagree. You can judge whether or not, uh, whether or not I'm correct. But I think what he's saying here is not, can, can God pick winners and losers, and he can do that because he's God, and it's, and it's his decision simply because he's God. I think what he's saying is, if God's people are not defined by their ethnic identity, by ethnic descent, if God's people are not defined by uh, whether or not they keep the law, hasn't God kind of broken the deal here? If he created a covenant with Israel, and part of that covenant uh, with this national entity, this which has an ethnic identity, and part of that covenant required them to keep the law, God's going back on his deal. Is, is God breaking the covenant in doing this? I think that's the question that Paul is answering in this section in Romans, and that's why he goes into this mercy and potter and clay language. So he says, he'll have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he will harden whom he will harden. As we look at the larger context of Romans 9 to 11, Okay, here's the question we have to ask. Who is receiving mercy and who is being hardened? When you get to Romans 11, you find out Israel has been hardened. It's a temporary hardening. That's what Paul says in Romans 11. Mercy has come to the Gentiles. So I don't think Paul is, is again getting into this sort of this philosophical, theological uh, question of does God choose people to be saved. I think what he's saying is he's having mercy on the Gentiles and the, and the Jews have been hardened. Contextually, that seems to me the, to make the most sense. So what about the potter and the clay language? This is actually from Isaiah 29 and 45, and these are basically national judgment oracles. Uh, these are oracles of, judge, of judgment, and clearly in Isaiah 29, it's an oracle of judgment against Israel. So the reason Paul is quoting this is he's reaffirming God's judgment of national Israel isn't something new. Go read the prophets. This is something that's happened before. And then Paul continues, What if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? He did so in order that he could make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy he prepared beforehand for glory. Us whom he called, and I think this is the kicker, I think this is the clarifying phrase, not only from Jews, but also from Gentiles. Is God not free to bring in the Gentiles even if Israel's hardening has happened as a result of that? I think that's what Paul's getting at here. The other thing that comes out of all of this that, that I, I find pretty interesting is, is Paul is 
picking examples from Israel's history where God's choosing is very counterintuitive to the context of the culture. Okay, so Abraham more or less is a pagan when God calls him. Um, Moses, we are, heard, we are told, Moses has a, some sort of a speech impediment. He's, he doesn't speak well. Okay, so what does God want him to do? Go talk to the well-educated Pharaoh of Egypt. All right, no problem, God. I got this. Okay. Um, Isaac, right? Uh, Isaac and Ishmael. There's the whole question there of, of legitimacy. Clearly with Jacob and Esau. Esau is the firstborn. In, th- in that context, he by all rights should have been the one through whom the chosen line followed, but it's Jacob. David, right? We've already noticed David, the smallest, the weakest of his brothers. He's not, he's not well built. He doesn't have handsome hair, but yet God chooses him to be the king of Israel. So I think, I think the other thing Paul is doing in part in picking these examples that he's picking is he's reinforcing God's choosing doesn't really follow our logic. Uh, so for God to bring in the Gentiles shouldn't cause us to question God. It should cause us to question our logic because our logic would have said Esau, not Jacob. Our logic wouldn't have said Moses. Our logic wouldn't have said Abraham. So there's, I think, this undercurrent of counter, counterintuitiveness, but still within this package of what Paul's focusing on is Gentile inclusion into God's people. Okay, moving on, a uh, couple of other observations. The Gentiles, we are told, obtained, uh, obtained their status ek pisteos. Now, this is usually translated as by faith. I, I take this to be rather a sort of a spatial idea. It's from faith. That's the typical, um, that's the typical uses of, usage of ek is it has some sort of a, a from idea and not from works. If you're interested in more about that, we can talk about that later, maybe. I don't think Paul's saying the Gentiles weren't trying to earn their salvation and the Jews were. I think, again, he's going back to what fundamentally marks the identity of God's people is Jesus. And that is connected throughout Romans and Galatians uh, to this pistis language. Pisteos Iesu often is the construction. There's a debate among scholars, is this Jesus' faithfulness that Paul is talking about, or is this our faith in Jesus? Grammatically, it could go either way. I think, some, I think it's, it's either, sometimes it's a both and. Jesus' faithfulness grounds our own. It doesn't mean that our faithfulness is excluded uh, as a result of it. So I think he's asking what marks the identity of God's people, and he, he clears this up. They stumbled over the stone of stumbling. I think clearly the stone of stumbling Paul's talking about is Jesus. They ignored and they seek to stand in their own righteousness, not submitting to the righteousness of God. The only other time Paul uses this phrase, righteousness of God, prior to this context in Romans 10 is in Romans 3.23. And the righteousness of God there is ek pisteos iesu, from the faithfulness of Jesus. So I think he's basically personifying this term as a reference to Jesus. The problem with the Jews uh, that Paul's talking about wasn't that they were trying to earn their salvation. The problem was they rejected Jesus, and Jesus is what defines who God's people actually are. And Paul tells us Christ is the goal of the law. Again, going back to Romans 8, uh, if anyone should have seen this, the law should have led them to the Messiah, but, but the Messiah became a stumbling stone for them. Um, I want to have time for questions, so we'll, we'll come back to some of this, and I'll just skip to uh, my conclusions. It's hard to talk about election in an hour, so. Um, all right, so some, some takeaways. So my, my big framework, I think what Paul is doing in Romans 9 to 11, and Ephesians 1 and 2, in Galatians 2 to 4, and Romans 3 and 4, is he's dealing with this question of what it means for Gentiles to be included in the people of God. And... For him, fundamentally, this identity is formed around Jesus. So any other markers of identity that, that are said to need to be imported into it, whether that be food laws, uh, like we have in Galatians 2, whether that be circumcision, like we find in Romans 4, none of those things should be added to uh, what it means to be identified in God's people. It's Jesus, it's the Messiah alone. 
So one of, one of my big takeaways, and, and hopefully um, something maybe you'll be encouraged to think about from today, is how we do theology and realizing that when we contextualize the New Testament or, or even the Old Testament in its historical context, when we get, and this is the key, when we get familiar, and this is hard, with the primary literature in those fields. So when we actually read some of these texts that were swimming around and some of these ideas that were in play, I think it opens up new windows of thought for us. And I think in a lot of ways, opens up new windows of thought on very old questions that we've been sort of stalemated on uh, because, because we've come to a point where we have two options, right? So you have to pick one or the other, and there's no other option. I think sometimes there are other options uh, and sometimes better options. And so getting into the first century context of the New Testament, I think, opens up new windows of thought. The other thing, just in thinking about election as a primarily collective idea, I think theologically and also missionally, this reinforces several things that are very important. One of those is that our identity as God's people is a, is a collective identity. And I think, especially in American evangelical, this is a message, we, uh, evangelicalism, this is a message we can't hear enough because our society is so individualized. Uh, we fail, I think, often to be deeply integrated into the life of the local church. And that is not what being a follower of Jesus, as portrayed in the New Testament, is about. So understanding our identity, it's not just me and Jesus and we're good. It's me as a part of God's people. There's a collective aspect to that. Our identity should also be a distinctive one. We should look differently from the world around us. This was one of the major struggles for Second Temple Jews as they lived in a Gentile, Hellenistic, dominated culture. And how can we maintain our faithfulness to God when everything around us is pulling us away from that? So thus we have these debates about what the best way to move forward is. And I, I think, again, this reinforces for us in our context the importance of God's people looking different from the world around them and carving out a, a different way of life that ultimately points people not to us so that we can say we're distinctive, but points them to Jesus. As we saw in the Old Testament, they were a kingdom of priests. If they're a kingdom of priests, who are they ministering to? They're ministering to the nations. I think that's, that's the intent of that language. And so us as God's people, uh, there's a missional intent behind um, God forming a people. It's not simply so we can, we can feel good about ourselves or we can know our eternal fate. It's so that we can engage with the world around us. I think there's also uh, something that this can tell us about ra racial reconciliation in our current context. When we think about election in Paul as fundamentally an issue about bringing Jews and Gentiles together in unity into God's people. I think there are analogies that we can draw from this where we understand the importance of, uh, of, of hearing others and not forcing our identity, our preferences, our traditions onto others simply because there are traditions. I think there's some analogy that we can draw here. And an ecclesiological soteriology, what does that mean? Um, I think the Roman Catholics kind of have this right, okay? There's no salvation apart from the church. I think what they get wrong is how they define the church. Uh, but understanding the people who are the saved are the church. You can't be a follower of Jesus and not a part of the body of Christ. Again, reinforcing that collective dimension. So I missed, I've, I've jumped over, obviously, some incredibly uh, important aspects of this discussion. Hopefully we can get to some of those things in the Q&A, but... Uh, I hope this has maybe opened up some new windows of thinking for you and, uh, and generated some questions and some new ways of, of doing theology, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing your questions here in a minute. So, thank you. Dr. Thornhill, will you um, discuss corporate representation in the New, in the new Testament mm -hmm. or in Paul, mm -hmm. uh, the in Christ language, mm -hmm. as well as the conditionality of election in mm -hmm. Paul? Yeah, so um, I think the, the main place that I deal with in the book is 2 Corinthians 5. Um, there's, I think, a pretty, a pretty clear example of corporate representation there in Paul. Uh, Paul does this in Romans as well. Uh, in both of those contexts, it's the, it's the in Christ versus Adam language, and so there's a, there's a sense of representation uh, as to 
belonging to one of those two groups. Um, as it relates to conditional election in Paul, did you, did you have a more specific angle of that that you were well, thinking about? Like how the, the elect are, are those who identify with Christ. Mm -hmm. They're defined by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And what is the condition on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's described in, in a couple of different ways. Um, so obviously there's the, you know, in Romans 10, which is one of the things I skipped over, uh, the famous, whoever calls upon the, the name of the Lord shall be saved, um, which really interestingly, just for Christology, uh, uh, Paul's quoting from, I think, Joel 2.32 there, which is a reference to Yahweh. The Lord there is Yahweh. So I think that, that uh, makes a pretty clear implication for us of who ex exactly Paul thought Jesus was. Um, so calling upon the name of the Lord, I think the faith language um, connects to that uh, as well, so in, in Galatians and elsewhere. Uh, but there's also um, one of the ways that this is sometimes described that's been really, really helpful and meaning for me, meaningful for me is understanding these categories of identification and participation. So part of the you know, representational idea of Jesus' death in some sense becomes our death, and Jesus' resurrection, in some sense, becomes our resurrection. We identify with that, uh, but we also participate in it because it has uh, dimensions for how we live that are, you know, that are resultant from our participation. So, you know, cruciformity becomes a way of life, and being empowered by the resurrection becomes a way of life. So, I, th I think those are those are some of the categories that I see in work at work there. Does that answer it? Come back. Okay. <laughs> well, like um, in your book, you talk about how uh, how the church or the elect are mm -hmm. are marked out as mm -hmm. those who believe in Christ. Like whereas in mm -hmm. the Jewish literature, it was those who observed certain mm -hmm. uh, certain uh, criteria mm -hmm. or were loyal to certain leaders, mm -hmm. those people were marked out as the, ele mm -hmm. as the elect. Mm -hmm. But like in, the, in Paul, it's those who identify with Christ, mm -hmm. like Christ is the chosen, or he's the, he's the elect one, mm -hmm. and the, all those who believe in him, mm -hmm. who confess him as Lord, are incorporated into mm -hmm. him, and therefore share in his, ele in his elect identity. Yeah. Sorry, I can't say that word today. Yeah, and, and Paul doesn't actually, I don't think Paul ever refers to Jesus as the chosen one or the elect one that, that comes in the Gospels. Um, but we have, you know, Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him. So there's clearly a, a Christological connection to, um, so yeah, those who confess and those who trust in Christ. And, you know, one of the dimensions of, of, of pistis language that I think is important is we sometimes define faith as belief. Um, and, it's, and, and it's almost sort of purely a cognitive thing. It's if you think the right way. Um, pistis language in the, sort of the range of meaning that it can take in the New Testament and in, and in you know, other literature. Is there's also a trust dimension to it. Um, so it's commitment and, and it's trust and, it, and it's also about fidelity. Um, so it's, it's yes, we have to think the right way, but I think the relational category in, in a lot of ways is probably primary over that, and then there's, there's behavioral implications that, that result from it as well. Um, so yeah, identifying in Jesus, those who, uh, those who confess Jesus as Lord are incorporated into him. We are in Christ. Uh, we are his body. You know, there's different metaphors that are used to describe that identity. Um, but, but that sort of, you know, if the question is, what, how do we get in Christ? It's, it's confessing Jesus as Lord. I think it's trusting him. And that is, you know, both an initial thing, but it's also a continuing thing. Um, and so, you know, we see often these, these pistu verbs are in the present tense. And if you, if you adhere to verbal aspect theory, probably what that's telling us is there's some ongoing duration that is implied by this. Um, so I think yes, those, those are connected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm Bob Stewart. Um, very grateful for this uh, talk, and um, 
very much in favor of um, reading Paul and Jesus within mm -hmm. the first century Second mm -hmm. Temple worldview. A um, <clears throat> couple of point, couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, chapter nine of Romans. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you see it as going beyond being counterintuitive mm -hmm. to subversive, mm -hmm. much like the parables of Jesus, that, that uh, a first century reader, whether a Jew or a Gentile, mm -hmm. would have understood more immediately what, uh, what Paul was getting at than a 21st century reader. Yeah. And so if you're a Jew, mm -hmm. you're hearing this message of, it's not only counter to how we would normally mm -hmm. think, it, it's a threat, sort of, sort of like mm -hmm. the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the two good guys, the guys with the white hat that you expect to do mm -hmm. the right thing, they do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. and Jesus says the neighbor yeah. is a Samaritan. And so he's saying to the Jews, uh, you haven't fulfilled mm -hmm. the covenantal plan that God had mm -hmm. for you. Uh, God is fulfilling it in Christ. Mm -hmm. The Gentiles are being brought in. Mm -hmm. It's part of his plan. So they've got his authority. It's not simply that they're crashing the party. Yeah. And he's saying to the Gentiles, if he's done this to his own people, mm -hmm. don't get uppity. Yep. And, and don't think he couldn't do it yep. to you as well. But his ultimate plan is to bring his own people back in mm -hmm. while retaining you. Yeah. So I would say it's it's... It's surely it's counterintuitive. Right. All subversive speech is counterintuitive, yeah. but it goes beyond that. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and <clears throat> I think maybe an opposite angle of that. I mean, he addresses the Gentiles with a similar thing in, in 11, um, but the way I read Ephesians 1 and 2, um, you know, there's a there's this consistency of pronouns at the beginning of Ephesians, and it's we 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 we, and then in, I think it's verse 13, it changes to you. Um, I think there's, there's actually probably a little bit of irony or subversiveness there as well. You know, we are elect in him, chosen before the foundation of the world, re receiving the inheritance, etc. And, you know, I can see Paul's readers kind of going, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then, but you mm -hmm. are Johnny come lately's. Yeah, so don't. And then that, I think, turns into Ephesians too. Don't, like you said, don't get uppity. Don't put yourself in a higher place. You actually are dependent upon what God has done in Israel for where you stand. Right. Uh, so don't ignore what, what has come before you. And that would tie back to, uh, to, to the Jew first and yep. also to the... Mm -hmm. um, my other question had to do with, um, do you think sometimes uh, as we are coming to a fresh understanding of Second Temple Judaism mm -hmm. that we tend to uh, see things in a dichotomous relationship uh, that really we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we do talk a lot about, as Americans, we, we're individualistic. Mm -hmm. I would say the American, the evangelical church has been among the most individualistic mm -hmm. in our society because of our evangelistic methods. Mm -hmm. But, um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, I'm thinking that you could see an individual point, uh, mm -hmm. an application, yeah. in a statement that was... Um, that was meant for the whole group. For mm. instance, it's April, the 15th is coming. Mm. Caesar had it wrong, beware mm. the Ides of April. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but um, my wife and I have gotten caught this year for the first time in an IRS regulation that is seriously not working <clears throat> in our favor. <laughs> <clears throat> I so thought you were going to say caught doing something else, so I, I, appreci no, no, I appreciate no. that's what you... <laughs> no, no, no. This is being recorded. So. <laughs> no, no it's, it's just uh, it's a law that yeah. has come into the tax code, but there aren't any others in yeah. the code. Um, but um, nobody in Washington wrote that law thinking about, well, we're going to trip Bob right. and Marilyn Stewart up. Right. <clears throat> but when we read this, <clears throat> this new law for a group of people... Mm -hmm. It resonates with individual application yeah. for us, and, and of course, our application is dang. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> you know, so I, do you think sometimes we hold these two things yeah. at opposite extremes? When, when if we, it'd be better to see them in the order uh, that they that the logic flows. Right. But but it's not this or that. Right. It's both and. Yeah. But in a different way. So yeah, it's not. I definitely think those aren't exclusive categories. Um, uh, 
what I what I think we see in the ancient world is a collect is a primary collective identity, and the individual identity is secondary. Whereas in our context, it's not that we don't have collective identities, but our individual identity is primary, and our collective identities are secondary. So, um, you know, in in lots of ways in the ancient world, your identity was basically formed for you. You know, where you were from, who your parents were. We, there wasn't the social mobility, largely, and there were exceptions, but uh, social mobility that we have now. So you were kind of confined to that collective identity um, based on just the way that society worked and how it was structured. So, but that doesn't mean there was no sense, obviously, of, of an individual in the ancient world as well. So we, I, yeah, I agree. I don't think we should see these necessarily as, as binaries, um, but I also think we tend to read things very individually uh, just because of our context. And, um, and we can't assume necessarily um, they're always doing, you know, do, doing the same. So when we see Jacob mentioned, for example, we think, oh, well, he's talking about an individual. Well, I think he's talking about Jacob as a representative of something, of something bigger. Um, that doesn't mean Jacob wasn't an individual. Obviously, he was. Um, but they had, I think, more of an interplay between individual and collective categories than, than we do. If I've answered all your questions, wow, I've really done my job, so. <laughs> Fill the gap. <laughs> if, um, uh, if someone at, at your church uh, learned that you wrote a book and grasped the thesis, and they said, uh, Dr. Thornhill, what it, it seems to me like you, you're interpreting, you're interpreting Paul's writings in the New Testament in light of extra biblical literature, mm -hmm. But, and they express concern because they know that you hold a high view of scripture right. and scripture is authoritative. How might you explain interpreting biblical literature in light of the meaning of extra biblical literature? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, you know, the comment that I would make um, is we, we put things in a context. Um, so the question is just what context are we putting it in? And if we don't have a clearer idea of what the original context was, uh, probably the context we're putting it in is, is our own. And so that's where I think we, you know, it's our challenge is to try to force ourselves to think in ways that would have been more reflective of, of how they would have thought in the first century because otherwise we're simply, you know, we're being anachronistic. We're simply reading later things back into it. And as, you know, as you couple that with what I mentioned at the beginning of the fact that Christian theology has a history, um, you know, when you recognize that history, you start to see where, I, where ideas come from and how they develop and how they, how they change over time. And, and again, it's not, to, it's not to say we need to cut all that away, because I don't think we should. I think, I think we need to embrace it more. I mean, um, you know, we, we, we and me included, I think, have too, too thin an understanding of, uh, of some of the great minds that have come before us. Um, but we're going to put it in some kind of a context. So the question is just, are we putting it in the right one? And I think we get closer to what that context looked, looked like by looking at some of these extra biblical sources. That doesn't mean, obviously, we treat them with the same sort of uh, place of primacy that we would um, with scripture. But on the other hand, I mean, there are, there are aspects of um, you know, there are aspects of this Jewish literature that are, I think, you know, almost devotional in a sense. I mean, some of them, some of the prayers that you read, some of the, you know, the Psalms, um, it opens a window into what, you know, how, how Jews in this time period were seeking to faithfully follow God. And so I think, I think you know, I think even from the literature, there are things we can learn and, and apply to our own spiritual lives. Um, but certainly not giving it any, any place of primacy in, term, in terms of, you know, if we find a contradiction between this and something Paul says, well, maybe we should take, you know, First Maccabees. Obviously, I think that's, that's the wrong approach. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's just like reading, you know, one of the church fathers. There's, there's, we, don't, we don't consider them inerrant, or we shouldn't at least. Um, but there are obviously things that we can learn and that we can apply and, and we can grow. So 
So I guess part of it is just, you know, is just is critical thinking in general, you know, just, just um, and that's any book that we read, whether it's an ancient one or, or a modern. Well, Augustine was inerrant, but <laughs> not, not, not at all. I'm Gerald Stevens. Thank you so much for your Thank presentation. You. Appreciate it so much. Uh, we're actually very simpatico in uh, what we are saying about Romans particularly. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my observation is not really exegetical mm -hmm. as much as just uh, amusing a reflection mm -hmm. on the nature of Paul's argument. If we are correct mm -hmm. um, in how we interpret corporately the election language mm -hmm. in Romans, it may be that the great tragedy of Romans is that Paul lost his argument. Mm -hmm. because it seems like to me, if you and I are correct, I think we're on the same page, uh, somehow we just, he, he didn't win that argument, mm -hmm. because when you talk to people in the church, mm -hmm. and you say, are you Israel, you don't get a yes answer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the great tragedy, if, if we are correct in what Paul is saying. Mm -hmm. Would you just reflect upon... Um, the context of Romans, and if this, if this position is correct, mm. what happened that we had this great tragedy that he actually lost the argument? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. We, you know, I think often um, we read so much discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And again, that's not to say there, it's, it's complicated, right? If you've taken a course on the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the best thing to say is it's complicated. Um, it's very complicated. But again, there's a story, you know, there's a story that precedes ours that's a part of ours. And um, God didn't simply wipe, you know, wipe the slate clean and, well, this didn't work out very well. I, I'll just, I'll start with a new thing and we'll call it the church. Um, so I, I think... I think uh, recognizing our, our connectedness, and again, this is, I think, this is Ephesians 1 and 2. It's, it's don't think so highly of yourselves that you forget where you are is dependent upon what God has done in Israel. Your Messiah <laughs> it was Israel's Messiah, the Messiah out of Israel. Um, in terms of how we got here, you know, my... My assumption without with having just done a little reading in this area and not a whole lot is because the church becomes primarily Gentile oriented and because there is a, a fairly heavy tension that develops, particularly after the fall of the temple, um, but certainly after the, the turn of the first century where Judaism and Christianity sort of officially part ways as it's sometimes referred to. Um, there's, there's then this antagonism that develops between Jews and Christians in terms of how they're reading scripture. And we have, you know, some of the early church apologists that are dialoguing with, um, you know, with Jews who are, who are rejecting how they're reading the Old Testament. And so I think, I mean, I think it's just, it's, it's sort of a, a historical happenstance. Um, but again, we, we tend to form our identity by who we are and who we're around. And, and so as the church becomes primarily Gentile oriented, um, its theology becomes primarily Gentile focused. And I think that's where, where some of the, uh, you know, some of the message gets lost. I was just talking with Dr. Harwood this morning, uh, kind of the spectrum of, of Paul studies right now is really interesting because there are, there are just all sorts of conversations that are happening all over the place. And the new perspective is actually kind of the, like, the old perspective on the block now. Um, so you have the traditional view of Paul, uh, which is, you know, in, in sort of concert with, with Luther and, and with others um, of that tradition. You have the new perspective represented by N.T. Wright and James Dunn and E.P. Sanders and a host of others. And again, they don't all agree on, on lots of things. Um, there's also this apocalyptic uh, approach to Paul um, with, with folks like Doug Campbell and Louis Martin and Beverly Gaventa, which is almost sort of a, I don't know if this is fair or not, but it's a very Bardian way of, of reading Paul. And then you have what's called the radical new perspective, uh, which 
are, is not called by itself the radical new perspective. They prefer Paul, the term Paul within Judaism. And what, what that group is arguing, and lots of insights I think that are very helpful, though the places where I disagree with them as well, um, is we need to stop thinking of Paul as being a Christian and that meaning he's of a different sort of religion than what's going on in, in Judaism. Paul viewed Jesus as the fulfillment of his expectations as a Jew. Um, he didn't convert to a new religion as, as you know, we kind of, we kind of frame it that way. Um, so I think there's a lot of people that, that are certainly trying to, to you know, let's, let's think about the 50s and 60s uh, AD and not the 70s and the 100s AD. Let's, uh, let's approach it from what's happening right there. And again, some, just in, in my reading, uh, though, there are lots of elements that I'm, I don't agree with. Um, I think thinking from that perspective has, has some value for us as we read Paul. You all have been far too kind. These were, these were uh, good questions. George Fry, a student, uh, you mentioned how the early church fathers didn't hold the same election definition <coughs> or mindset that currently <clears throat> people have, and that Augustine may have been a catalyst for that. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there was a change, and uh, why would it have occurred? How did it occur mm -hmm. from then to now? Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not an Augustine expert. Um, I did do a doctoral seminar on him, so, uh, but I wouldn't consider myself an Augustine expert. Um, it shows you the more you know, the less you know kind of thing, right? So that's, that's my experience. Um, my sense is it's the Pelagian controversy and um, that Augustine in, um, in answering that he, his view, I mean, his view from his early writings is, is different. So I think he, um, you know, maybe takes it too far in order to, to squash what's going on with, with Pelagius. And I think we see this, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the ways that I kind of look at church history is we see these, these pendulums throughout. Um, and, you know, rarely when a controversy happens do we kind of, we land in the middle, it's always back and forth. So, um, you know, the, the Christological controversies in the, in the second, third, and fourth centuries, it's Jesus is human, Jesus is not human, he's only divine, Jesus is only human, he's not divine, and fortunately, the church, you know, the church maintains both of the, those things. Um, but there's these poles, you know, these poles of extremes, and it, it takes a while to correct it. Um, so I'm not that familiar just in, in my study with, with post-Augustine, um, but I think not the same thing is happening in the Reformation, but there's a similar, so, you know, with Pelagius, it's, it's basically, can a person not sin and, you know, and just be okay? Um, so not, a, not exactly the same thing, but definitely the emphasis is upon the human ability to, to do something. And so the abuses that, that Luther sees within the Roman Catholic Church, again, not the same thing, but I think they're of a similar vein. And so he finds, you know, a, a, I think a, um, you know, a friendly voice in Augustine to address some of his concerns. And, and so, to, you know, to me, that, that just reemphasizes the importance of as we read theology and especially as we read um, his, theologians and history of understanding where they're coming from and understanding their context and what's going on. And it's the same thing for us too. And that's the danger, right? I think, I think about this from time to time, like, especially once you put something in print, like there's, you have to live with it the rest of your life. So, um, so there's that, but, uh, you know, 50 years from now, what, what were our blind spots, uh, that later theologians are going to say, 
man, they were just really, really off base here. And every, every generation of the church, unfortunately, has them because we're fallible and we, and we live in a messy world with, with you know, um, with messy context. So that's my sense, though, um, not being an expert, but that's my sense of what happened. <clears throat> Hey, I'm Derek Kittle, and I'm a student here. Um, you're the second scholar I've heard say uh, connect uh, Paul's um, new perspective with racial reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Can you further elucidate on what you mean by that? Yeah. So, so one of the things that the new perspective emphasizes is, and this, has, this conversation has primarily occurred in the context of justification, but one of the interesting things about justification language is most of the time when you find it, it's in the context of Jew-Gentile relations of some sort. Um, <clears throat> so however different new perspective authors tease that out, and again, they, dis they disagree on what exactly that means, um, they recognize whatever we say about Paul's justification language, we have to think about how this Jew-Gentile dimension plays into that. Um, so a similar thing with, you know, with election, the two passages that I see Paul be, being most explicit with this election kind of language are Romans 9 to 11 and Ephesians 1 and 2. Um, and, if, and both of those are just loaded with this, with this Jew-Gentile tension. So you know, when, you read, um, when you read some of the Greco-Roman literature describing Jews, and when you read some of the Jewish literature describing Gentiles, they're not in love with each other. Um, you know, the Jews are lazy because they don't work on the Sabbath. You know, they're just a lazy people. Um, <clears throat> so, ag again, there's, there's two different ethnic identities here, and there's two cultural backgrounds that, uh, that are associated with them. So it's, it's not identical to our context, but I think the analogy is... Um, what I think Paul is, what I think Paul is trying to do, and, and this is why I think he uses the example of Abraham in a couple of places. <clears throat> Abraham was uncircumcised when he met God, and he became circumcised. So in a sense, I think Abraham for Paul bears both a Gentile identity and a Jewish identity. And when he connects those dots, um, I think he's saying you can, you can maintain your identity as a Gentile in Christ without becoming a Jew, which means being circumcised, among other things. And Jews can maintain their identity. They can continue. You know, Paul nowhere tells Jews, stop circumcising your male children. Um, so they can maintain their identity. So they don't, they don't give up on their ethnic background. But there are also concessions that they have to make in order to live in unity as God's people. And so Galatians 2, all right, perfect example of this. Uh, Peter stops eating with Gentiles because cer certain Jews from James basically pressure him to, it seems. Um, <clears throat> so Peter gives in to, to the primacy of his Jewish ethnic identity and abandons focusing on the unity of, of living with Gentiles. Um, and there are, I think there are other examples of that as well. And, and so to me, this, this also connects, Paul doesn't connect it, and I, I don't think in either of those contexts, but this also connects with the importance of cruciformity in the Christian life about not, you know, Philippians 2 to me is one of the most important passages for the Christian life in all the New Testament, not seeking our own interests, but seeking the interests of others. How do, we, how do we live in such a way where it's not about us, it's about others? And sometimes that means um, we don't pursue our preferences. We, we, accommodate, you know, we, we give in in order for unity to become primary. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Question. Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about the radical new perspective and them being Bardian, and I don't know anything about that. Yeah, <laughs> that would be the apocalyptic Yeah, oh, sorry, school. yeah, apocalyptic. <clears throat> but I did want to touch on uh, your, your book and your idea of corporate election mm -hmm. with Bart. Mm -hmm. And so Karl Barth holding mm -hmm. to people are elected. Christ is the one elected. People are in him. Mm -hmm. How does your book and your ideas connect to Karl Barth and his views of election? I think they're comparable. Um, again, I'm not a Barth scholar. I've, I've, read, um, I've read 
I have not read all of the dogmatics. For those who have, kudos to you. Um, I, have read, I have read some portions of the dogmatics. Um, so I, I think there's a comparability. I, I don't think we're probably saying exactly the same thing. And his, um, you know, kind of how he filters that is Christ is both rejected and elect, and, and he sees that as connecting then with humanity. So I, there's, a, I mean, there's a sense in which, obviously that, that's true in a sense. Um, so I'm appreciative of Bart. I, I just, I haven't studied him enough, but those that have, I think, think there's some complementarity between them, but, but certainly probably, I know we don't, you know, come down on everything the same way, so. Yeah. My name's Aaron. I'm an MDiv languages student here. Good. I was wondering, in reference to Romans 8, 28 through 30, <laughs> when Paul is talking about predestined mm -hmm. and those who he foreknew, is Paul, in that context, is he speaking of believers as a corporate nation of Israel mm -hmm. who have put their faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah, mm -hmm. or is he more focused on individuals that God has chosen this person to be saved and this person to be condemned and go to hell, right. or is he focusing on those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus as Messiah and Lord as a corporate nation? Mm -hmm. I think he's primarily focusing on the collective. Um, when you look at a, it's not every word that's used, but an, a good portion of the vocabulary that's used in that section are terms that are used to refer to Israel in the Old Testament. So called ones, um, certainly chosen. <clears throat> even even uh, one of the things that N.T. Wright points out in his giant book on Paul is love language in the Old Testament is connected to the covenant. There's, it's, a covenantal, um, it's a covenantal idea. So I, th I think... What I read Paul doing there, I think he's focused on the collective, but I think it's also a bit of a setup for what he's about to say in Romans 9 to 11. Um, because in a sense, he's sort of preloading the discussion about this refigure, reconfiguring of God's people by addressing this predominantly Gentile church with language that was primarily used of Israel in the, in the Old Testament. So I think he's sort of preloading the discussion that he's going to unpack in 9 to 11 um, and again, though he doesn't make this explicit in the context, I think, I think he's setting up basically this, this discussion of Gentile inclusion. It's a good question, though, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult passage for sure. And kudos to you on doing the languages. I teach, I teach Greek, so anytime I get a I get a student that I meet that's digging in the hard work. I try to encourage them. Let's take another opportunity to thank Dr. Thornhill. coming.